Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Welcome to the online home of the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. My name is Josep Graubouvet, and I will be the host of this talk. This is actually the second lecture of the ISH guest lecture program. Um, this lecture series is now part of what we call the ISH Academy. We launched the Academy in 2019, and it offers lectures, workshops, executive courses, and so on. Before we start, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended these lectures before, um, you'll notice that all of you are, are muted and the communication will happen through the chat mode. You will see that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can write your questions here and I will be, uh, I will be relying these questions to um, the speaker after the talk. Um, the talk is going to take more or less 40 minutes and then we'll have more or less 20 for questions and answers. If you have any problems with the sound or with the video or any other dots that are not uh, questions for the speaker, you can write to me on the chat and we'll do our best to, to solve any issues. Um, that's everything. I will now introduce the speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Jürgen Huber. He's a master cabinet maker, senior furniture conservator, and I hope I'm not giving any spoilers if I also say he's a boathouse builder. He's an assessor for ICON and a member of the Church of England Sculpture and Furnishings Advisory Committee. For many years, Jürgen has been applying his deep understanding of interconnected sustainability issues and has, his, has put this experience into practice at the Wallace Collection and also his private life. And I hope we're going to hear about these very interesting experiences. Over to you, Jürgen. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I hope everyone hears me well. Um, seeing me is not so important, but uh, yeah, I'm going to share my um, slide. Uh, I hope that it all works now swimmingly. Um, yeah, just to say, um, you're up here on the third floor of Furniture Conservation Studio of Savolos Collection. It's basically, if I show you with my cursor, it's up here at the very top, where we are at the moment. That's where it's all recording. Uh, if you come to Manchester Square now, you would see the Wallace Collection obviously slightly darker than the slide. And that's what you see, and that's a facade of Hartford House. And Hartford House, where you see it here, was converted to what you see in about 1872 to 1875. And it's an amazing building. Uh, he, Richard Wallace, uh, employed the fantastic architects to get this house to this standard and to actually house his uh, collection of amazing artwork. So it's, it's an incredible building. It's uh, got very thick wood, got passive ventilation. I don't know if you can see my cursor underneath these windows. You have uh, air gaps, so air vents for passive ventilation. You've got very thick brick walls for thermal mass. You have high ceilings inside it. And on top of it, you had uh, cedar wood cladding all around on the inside of the building and cedar wood is obviously also an insect repellent. So everything was done fantastically well. We even had awnings. You can see these boxes around inside the windows, which used to be the awnings originally. However, they have been removed when it was converted to museum. And that's basically where the journey starts a little bit. That's my, my ethos of my talk tonight. And I just show you how that is sort of uh, planned to be. I'm talking about Hartford House a little bit, then about my work as a conservator, then why save energy, and then energy reduction in practice. And so back again to the next one. You see again that slide. And uh, I want to tell you a bit more about Hartford House. Uh, unfortunately, when it was converted to a museum in, uh, in 1898, and it opened as the Wallace Collection in 1900, which is, by the way, I mean, <laughs> one of the biggest bequests ever given to a nation it, it, in terms of value for, of, of these art objects. It's just uh, quite unbeatable. It uh, didn't come with an endowment, so there was no money attached to it, but the artwork is just literally billions of pounds. It's incredible. Uh, you look at these things we got inside here, amazing. If you, if you don't know about it, do come in. It's vast majority is French uh, artwork, uh, a lot of furniture, of course, paintings, and we got also a fantastically great armory inside it. 
but obviously I'm not talking just about objects tonight. Uh, the slideshow, it's going to be quite fast, uh, quite quick. It's going to be thought provoking. All of these slides are sort of put together with the intention to actually yeah, provoke a debate. Obviously, we haven't got too much time to debate that afterwards. But um, yeah, without further ado, I'm going to start here. As I said, uh, at the beginning, they would have had awnings here, and we had a fantastic student, Eva, who actually did her dissertation in 2016, actually a UCL student, doing her dissertation on light pollution in the Wallace Collection. And what you see here is a reconstruction of what she thought it may have looked like or could look like today with these awnings uh, in place. And I just put that engraving next to it, this engraving from late 18th century, on Parisian Street, and what you can see is literally every window has awnings. But around 1900, when the Hartford House was converted to the Wallace Collection, to a museum, um, or to House of Wallace Collection, sorry, to, to, it's still Hartford House, but to House of Wallace Collection, and turned it into a museum or the Wallace Collection, um, these awnings were taken away. So we don't know exactly when this happened and why that happened, but yeah, it's it's a bit something I would like to have back again, and many others would like to have them back again, because it would actually reduce light pollution in the galleries tremendously, and also the heat gap. So, but now planning permission is required, and there are quite a few issues around that, so it's not that easy, not that straightforward. But I just want to show you that the light as a damaging factor has been well understood, obviously, not just the heat, but, but uh, damaging as well. What I've got here is now just a, a little bit about the recent project, what I've been doing for the last so many years, researching one particular cabinet maker, called Johann Heinrich Riesner, but he's better known as Jean-Henri Riesner, and the book has just come out, so if you're interested in furniture, do have a look. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's quite a bit of research has gone into it. But also, if you just uh, search for Reisner on the internet or the Reisner project, you will find some uh, amazing 3D animated videos, etc. They actually show how these furniture, how these pieces are made. It's all about the furniture maker. And I took that slide and I mentioned that here because obviously I'm talking about the museum environment and uh, be talking about how we maintain that museum environment. And at the beginning, I did mention Victorian architect did the Hartford House to the very best standard and converted it to house this amazing collection of art objects. But then when it was converted to museum or to public museum, they actually uh, installed central heating and that got a lot of problems and also took these awnings away. And again, I'm going to talk about this in more detail. So when we're talking about light pollution, that is what's happening. So uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but I'm basically going over these mounts. Here you've got the mounts on, here the mounts are taken off, and the color does not just fade, it changes. So from a kind of a blue to a kind of a green. So it has to be borne in mind, and that is, 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 is a one-way ticket. I mean, you can't reverse that damage. Light damage is permanent, and it's, it's quite graphic, as you can see here. And uh, obviously not just in the Wallace collection, in any other collection around the world, they've all got exactly the same problem. Is if you want to show these objects, obviously you need light, and that will, will in fact, uh, uh, accelerate the decay. It's no other way to describe that. And obviously our job as conservators is uh, to look after these objects and to, to decelerate the decay, uh, slow this decay down to an absolute minimum. But even so, it's still very difficult and, and you know you can't stop it. So um, with the slide damage, I just put that graph in here, which I just go over, is to show you that all light is damaging and it's an accumulative factor. And obviously many people just talk about UV light, that's the most damaging aspect in the light spectrum. Uh, but all light is damaging. And when we go over to the infrared, obviously heat is also damaging. And that brings me again back to the central heating story. That uh, very early on, because we got a lot of pool furniture in the Wallace collection, pool furniture is made of turtle shell, brass on an oak carcass. So you have literally turtle shell, sea living turtle, not tortoise, and you have brass. And these materials are right next to each other. And, um, and they expand and contract at a complete different rate. And that is basically through heat that will actually get tremendously damaged. And because the central heating was installed, 
own furniture suffered tremendously within the first few years of the Wallace Collection opening. And basically, they opened uh, the furniture conservation workshop at the time they employed someone called the furniture repairer to just repair all that furniture. So by their fixed uh, disease, so to say, um, they didn't really get to the bottom of, of what caused uh, that damage on furniture. And, uh, and that was only addressed many years later in the 1980s when air conditioning was installed here at the Wallace Collection. But now air conditioning has obviously a huge, it's, it's, it's very energy intensive, has a huge carbon footprint. And that's basically, my talk is built around that, that uh, quite essentially as you find out now. So um, uh, when you look now at the energy we use for that, you've got obviously the question, why save energy? So what I'm talking, my argument is, do we really have to have air conditioning system to create best environmental conditions for our objects? Or is it possible to actually create a very good internal environment without costing the earth? And I just want to expand on that issue quite a bit. And you see here, why save energy? Obviously, CO2, that's, you know, or just not, we all know about that. CO2 level has gone sky high. Is it man-made or not? People still debate about it and can we actually do anything about it? Is it too late? And all of these questions. But I just want to say it's also an, an economical question about that. You know, here I got the Sunday Times quote of uh, 2014 and between 2004 and 2014, the um, annual gas and electricity bill has increased almost threefold. Yeah. So it's also an economical question yeah and i put this one in here uh, just remember that the first earth day was 1970. um i just find it amazing because a lot of people i think lose sight of how long we we had these issues and and what we've done about it or rather what we haven't done about it i mean that's 50 years ago that's a half a century ago uh, uh, where we actually understood something i've got some more headlines here it's actually sort of why save energy um, yeah, well, actually, the effects was again known um, very early on. There's a newspaper article from 1912 uh, from New Zealand, in fact. Uh, the effects may be considerable in a few centuries. I mean, he, the author got that wrong, but uh, the issue was already understood then that we have a problem in a few decades or centuries. We have here Jimmy Carter, that's a screenshot of a TV uh, presentation he did on the televised energy address to the nation in 1977. He's saying, if we do not act quickly. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, it's quickly in that there. Here you got Margaret Thatcher addressing the UN and talking actually about climate change in 1989 and saying it, it's really urgent. And not that she did anything about it, but at least it became mainstream. So we can actually credit her with that one, that it became mainstream and big corporations and companies actually looked beyond petroleum and really tried to invest a lot of money in solar technology and in the development of solar technology. So it's been going on for, for some time. And obviously uh, we have a problem now. These are just headlines from the last few years. So again, my issue, well, I built my argument around it, is do we really uh, need to look after objects in the way that we, uh, that we destroy our own habitat? You know, I mean, we, we're creating the perfect museum environment by destroying our own habitat. Is, is that, can that be, you know? Can we not do something a bit more sensible and, and you know, um, and still look, our, our, look after our objects? And, uh, and here, it, it's just, here it's, Nothing summarizes it better than this picture of this this church in the middle of this of this water. Yes, this parish church in the middle of all of this water being completely flooded. And just to say, um, later on, I'm going to go to maintenance of a building a bit. But you know, uh, even if, if if the vicar cleared all the leaves and has the gutter perfectly clean and has perfectly maintained that church, the roof is not leaking. Well, that's totally nullified by that problem, by that overwhelming problem all around it. You know. Um, the Wallace collection could be here, you know, if the water levels rise by X meters and if these weather extremes become more and more frequent. And that is what's happening. I mean, a lot of research has been done 
and the weather extremes do become more frequent, these century events become every few decades and the one every few decades happen every few years. And obviously here you've got the same problem in, in Venice. Um, another few headlines from the last few years and we're talking about uh, the effect climate change has now already on humanity and, and on people's life. And I just, it's, it's terribly sad. I mean, you know, there are some 60,000 Indian farmers linked to climate change. They've committed suicide and it's all linked to climate change. You would really have to read these articles. These are 60,000 individual people, 60,000 people which lives affect other people's lives. You know, it, it's terrible what's going on at the moment. So that's why we really have to save energy. And it's just so important and it's so easy to save energy. And people just have to understand that, you know, if you want to do something, you know, don't point with your finger at other people, just get your own wallet out and, 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 and do something good with your money and actually, you know, actively participate on the transition to clean and plentiful energy because you have lots of problems. And of course, uh, people always argue we overpopulated, we have too many humans living on planet Earth and all of that. And I would always argue back, well, it's a distribution problem. If you see that graph here, that's uh, 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 cumulative CO2 emissions since 1715, obviously biggest one is America, but then uh, Russia and whatever else here, I can't see, it's small for me now. Uh, it just, you know, it's a distribution problem. It really is, there's enough for everyone around to go around. It's just how we use that energy. So there's plenty of energy, our whole civilization, if you want to call that, is built on energy. We have released huge amount of energy over the years. And that's why we're sitting here and we have a Zoom talk and all of that. But, you know, we can, we can, we have to change that. We have to change them and we have to change it very quickly. And again, why saving energy? Well, you know, if you save energy, you don't have to produce any energy in any sort of way. And, and to say um, energy is just, you know, it's there. We have enough energy and we have to just be very careful with it and how we produce it. And there again, I want to say, and that's going to be in the next few slides, in whatever way you produce energy, you will annoy some people or another. So, for example, next slide here. If you, for example, use lignite, which is just happened to happen in Germany, we have the biggest lignite reserves in the world. So it's just a huge amount of lignite down in the ground. And uh, it's something which is not enough reported. Germans are aware of it, and, and most people who think about energy are aware of it, but I don't think it gets enough uh, attention as it should, because when you look at these enormous stickers, I don't know if you see them, if, if you see my cursor here, these, 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 these stickers are just absolutely ginormous. I mean, each shovel can easily take a mid-terrace house in London in, without any problems. And these are just a handful of villages, a few villages which have been raised to the ground if I tell you now, in the last 90 years, over 300 villages have been raised to the ground, just like a village like this from here, with churches, with parishes, whatever, and, and thousands and thousands of people have been rehoused in Germany to make place for these stickers. And that happened in the, in the last 90 years. We're talking about over 300 villages, and we're talking about thousands of people which had to be rehoused in new villages. And obviously, it has a huge impact on the groundwater level and environmental level directly is tremendous. And just to give you an idea of the scale I put in this map in, I don't know if you see that, that's obviously one of these lignite uh, or coal uh, revere uh, lignite uh, fields where that gets um, extracted. And, and the area, but that's just like one area here where I got the red dot, there are many other areas in Germany, but in fact three, three uh, uh, overall a big, areas and then they're divided in many smaller ones. Uh, all of them together are the size of all of what fits into the M25 here. That's the size of all of that ticking, yeah, on landscape being changed permanently. It, it's enormous. It's bigger than Greater London and slightly smaller than what fits within the M25. But just to give you an idea of scale, and of course people work in this industry, but, but uh, 20,000 people worked in 2016 in the lignite industry, but uh, 20,000 people lost their job in 2019, uh, courtesy to the government um, 
turn U-turn on, on renewable energy. And I'm going to explain that in a second. We have a next one. Well, if you don't like uh, mining for lignite, you may want to go and uh, go uh, for uh, coal mining, deep cast coal mining. And here you've got like uh, here lovely uh, Saar region here, just, just below Luxembourg. Uh, Salo Lux region, you've got a fantastic World Heritage site. So if you're interested in, 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 in industrial heritage, do go to Folklingen. As Folklingen is, is a World Heritage site, is absolutely amazing. And what you see next to here, it's a lot of coal mining going on there. That's the area I come from, by the way, from this area, Salo Lux Falls. So what you see here is an amazing power station works with, with, Ligna, with, no, sorry, with hard coal, which has just been mined there around the corner. And it's actually, in fact, the first chimney list power station in the world. It was very, very advanced coal power station. It's I mean, still got the chimney, but what it actually refers to, they're cooling towers. And you do have one chimney here. But basically, they have fantastically um, clean all the air, clean all the soot out. So you have a, a chimney list in the sense that there's only CO2 emission and hardly any other uh, pollutants. But all of that gets washed out, and guess what's happened? That massive mountain here in the background, you have a blue arrow here showing, that's all the ashes and slack and so on and so forth. Some of it gets pumped down into the mine, and some of it stays above. Some of it gets turned into building material. It's terrible. So if you don't like lignite mining, you don't like coal mining, well, save energy. I mean, then we really have to save energy, yeah, um, because most of our energy today, even electricity, is, is fossil-based, fossil fuel-based. So that is, it's very important to understand that. And so basically you go um, here with all of these issues you got here. In addition, you've got earthquakes quite frequently. These mine fall down. And often the ashes get mixed with water, which actually breaks into these mines. And this water slowly seeps up to the top surface again and mixes with the surrounding groundwater. And you have huge issues there with drinking water. And yeah, as I said, on every slide, I could talk much, much longer, but um, I move on. Now, if you don't like any of that, what about nuclear power? Well, nuclear power it sounds very obvious. It's a great choice, you know, um, clean energy and so on and so forth. But again, again, you have to look really careful. And again, people forget about it. It's not, you know, accidents are one thing, but you know, there has been not one successful decommissioning of any nuclear power plant anywhere in the world. Take my word for it and you can look it up. What you have, you have decommissioned nuclear power station, but you still have uh, nuclear waste, which cannot be disposed of. And there's not one last resting place anywhere in the world. And the few which were built, one, for example, a couple were built in Germany, in Borleben, in Asser, and, and they failed. They failed miserably. And now the search for a last resting place for the nuclear race for Endlager is still ongoing in Germany. And so every country has a little quest on finding a, a resting place. Because it is, it's, it's very nasty stuff and it stays ra radioactive for not just decades, hundred years, but for thousands of years. So, I mean, just bear this in mind. Also, a lot of people talk always about embodied energy. What do you think how much embodied energy is in, in so much concrete you see there? And you can't just break that concrete up, apart from being the toughest concrete you can possibly buy, uh, because it's radioactive. A lot of it's radioactive, obviously not all, but in terms of volume, it's still a hell of a lot uh, you have to dispose of in some way or another. But the biggest problem, or what I find the biggest problem is, that nuclear power doesn't work in the summer very well. Because all you do, you heat a bit of water and it's, it's, a, it's a kettle and then you drive a turbine and that's it. It's actually very primitive, despite all the claims of all the fanciful nuclear reactors they never actually ever materialized. Yeah, not in the last years and they won't materialize in the next few years. Never mind terrorism, all of that. So uh, I got here's a headline here because uh, a lot of the nuclear power stations in France as well as in Germany are next to rivers and rivers cool them. Because we had more droughts than ever, we had heat waves. So water which went into the nuclear power plant in the Ardèche region in France, there's a nice nuclear power plant in the Ardèche, really picturesque landscape, and then you got the things on there. Um, they had to turn it off. They had to turn it down completely because the water was already, water level was very low. It was already so hot, if that would have gone to the plants, through the cooling towers, it would have killed the last bit of wildlife in that, in that river. 
And in Germany, the same happened to coal power plants. So when it gets really hot, you have to actually turn these things off. So when a lot of people talk about what do you do when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, well, what do you do when nuclear power has to be turned down or turned off completely? There's a world nuclear status report. Uh, again, you can Google all of these things and find these out. It's really, it's amazing. Another little problem is obviously uh, the government indemnity. Um, it's basically uh, what it means, a nuclear operator, nuclear power plant operator only pays the first whatever, let's call it a billion pounds. But the government pays the rest. That is clear. It, the, the nuclear power plant, is it, that's a huge subsidy. They don't have to pay any insurance. So anyone has EV solar on their rooftop or has a wind turbine, they all have to pay insurance. Well, they don't have to pay insurance. They pay a little bit, but you know, they cover, but it's nothing in proportion to the action risk, which is insane, yeah, to my mind. And, and if you look at your insurance policy, if you have one and you own a house and you're lucky enough you own a house, like myself, well, the bank owns it, but you actually find exclusion even in your in your house insurance that you actually they don't pay if there's any nuclear accident. And that's an enormous subsidy, an enormous subsidy. Think about Deepwater Horizon, BP, Deepwater, Deepwater Horizon accident, that cost BP some 60 billion pounds. Yeah, I mean, they must be kicking themselves. You know, if it would have been nuclear, there would have not been, there would have been liable maybe for the first five, if, if, if at all. And that's the uh, issue what we have to talk about when we talk about uh, fossil fuels or nuclear power. Uh, the energy density of nuclear as well as, as fossil is just unrivaled. You know, it's just, the energy density, and that is why it makes it so attractive for investors to actually go for, for nuclear and, and fossil, because you can create a, a huge income with very little manpower. And just to show you that, again, if you look at Roll One, here you've got a company, an American company, uh, which makes six billion pound profit whenever that year was, uh, last year, I think it's 2019 or something, with two million and two million and two hundred thousand employees, so two million and two hundred thousand people created enough income to pay CEO and everyone else a huge salary, and then obviously themselves some salary, and still making a profit for the shareholders and everyone else of six billion. Not bad. Now you go to row six is an oil and gas company, and yes, it made a hundred and ten billion pound profit. Hundred and ten billion pound. Profit. Oh but only employs 76,000 people. Uh, I mean, the different, that is, that is what, what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, if you want to reduce a huge amount of energy with wind and solar, you know, you need a huge amount of space and lots of engineering, a lot of high paid jobs. And um, to actually create that sort of, of income is nearly impossible because the energy density is just not there. Now back to, uh, um, well, I'm a great advocate of, of uh, renewables, but I'm not against uh, nuclear whatsoever. I think nuclear fusion is fantastic. And nuclear fusion, we got the sun, and that's the safest thing we can have. I mean, it's the best nuclear fusion reactor nearby, and that's what we have to harvest. That is where we have to really kick in and really do something uh, with that energy. And here where we see that, uh, what a lot of people don't get is like solar nicely complements the demand curve. So what you see here is like a German graph, a graph from Germany. So you have here Agora, you have here the demand, you've got your also conventional power station and you've got solar down here and other renewables down at the bottom. And what it shows you is nicely the solar goes exactly into the demand curve. And so it actually fits perfectly because during the day we still have more energy consumption than at night. And that is like from uh, MyGrid GB, which is fantastic. It shows you here, uh, wind is red in this occasion, nuclear is, is green, and solar is, is yellow, just to give an idea how much energy just been produced with wind turbine. There's a website called Wind Europe. And that's again from, from MyGrid GB. It's just fantastic when you look at 2012 energy, that's just eight years ago, and now today, uh, that's nuclear share, that's wind share, that's bio biofuel, in, in this case it's wood chip and the trucks plant, it's still better than oil and coal, that's what I say. 
you've got solar, gas, and so on. So you can see how it pushed away coal, um, and these are actually imports, but we could do much, much better. We got the technology, we got it all there. Another quick graph to show you again how uh, renewables in Germany pushed all the other powers down quite substantially, that this hugest gain is with renewable, and that it's 2017, that's also 2017, and just shows you that the investment in Germany has gone down. So that is quite interesting when you see that the investment's gone down by renewable shares gone up simply because the cost has declined so much. And uh, yeah, this just shows you here uh, in 2019, we had 46% electricity came from renewable in Germany and 30% and electricity from renewable in, in Britain. And that just shows you the differences from 2005 uh, when it was 10% in Germany and in Britain it was in 2012 only 6%. So actually in Britain the transition has actually been quicker than in Germany. And then here the thing, what do you do if you have too much energy? Uh, what do you do if the sun shines and the, and the wind does blow? Well, at the moment in Germany that they have to barely uh, pay to have the electricity taken up from them. We pay Austria a huge amount of money uh, because the prices go into the negative territory quite frequently. So all the green down here is, is renewable, all the gray is conventional, and that's the cost per kilowatt hour. So the, the kilowatt hour is basically looking below five pence, yeah, just to put that clear on the wholesale market. And uh, what do you do with all of that energy? Well, in Germany, in Saarland, which I just showed you earlier, it's a slide from Völkling, Völkling, the Weltkulturerbe, um, you can see uh, World Heritage Site, sorry, World Heritage. you can see that in uh, Germany they have now the first uh, hydrogen-powered steel plant in Dillingen, where they actually uh, take all of that energy and convert it into hydrogen and then locally they turn it into, into hydrogen-based steel. So you don't actually need coal anymore to, to uh, make, make uh, steel, high-quality steel. Or in this case, as in Germany, you can actually see a video for that as a company, which uh, offers to turn all your power into hydrogen, you store it in bottles, and then you basically run a fuel cell of it, and you've got all the way around uh, energy, electricity, uh, and you're not even connected to the grid. You're not, you don't have a connection to the grid. And then you have here a headline from very recently, BBC, to use air to store it, it's possible. Back to the Wallace collection, I hope you're still with me, and, uh, and now we actually see that all in practice, all of that, so I just want to hammer that in, why saving energy is so important, um, and why we have to look in how to produce our own energy, as, as, as an individual as well as as a country. You see, at the time, uh, we're running uh, slightly uh, late, but we see. So here we go, back to the Wallace collection, Hartford House, and what I want to show you here is just like one wall which has been newly rendered with lime mortar because what they discovered actually they used inappropriate material in this case um, cement based mortar which damaged the brickwork tremendously behind it and I just want to say how important it is the first thing to save energy is to, to really really maintain your, your building properly and use the most appropriate uh, repairs or, or restoration material you can have on your building and that comes straight after or even before maintenance. And maintenance means literally here, we got gutters all the way around here. And years back, I went with and head of facilities around there and to clean the gutters one, one uh, autumn day. And it was completely blocked with leaves. And it's just extraordinary how a building which is quite tall, but we surrounded Manchester Square, got quite a few leafy trees, how many leaves got stuck on these downpipes and everything. It, amazing. So if you don't do maintain your building properly, well, a dump wall is a bad insulator. But there's a lot of information available. Um, as, I, as I point out, it's not much. Yeah. Uh, here, the first thing, so once, once your building is properly maintained, the next step would be to actually look for decent LED. And again, LED had quite a bit of a bad reputation when they first came out because the light was horrendous, no question about it. But then gradually, actually quite quickly, uh, we got these filament LEDs with an amazing light spectra. That's a light spectra here on the back, 
And just to show you, here's a compact fluorescent one, terrible. Here you've got the incandescent ones. Incandescent, obviously, everything goes into heat. So literally, with an incandescent one, you've got about 90% of that energy goes into heat and about 10% into light. Whereas with LED, it's exactly the other way around. So it's amazing what you can do. And obviously, behind here, you've got daylight. So what we did at the Wallace Collection, we replaced, and they're not all replaced yet, but most of our lights are now LED lights, even spotlights, and instead of halogen, they've got now very nice uh, LED lights. And so that was the first step, and that's, that's pretty low cost uh, to do that. The next step, what we did is, is which I did personally, I was very uh, um, adamant that we changed that. We had... Um, uh, fiberglass optics installed for some of our display cases here and they're basically uh, halogen powered they had a hundred watt halogen light bulb inside there and because these material that material here i mean these images you see here it's actually taken from underneath this island display case here in the middle so these two images uh, just be aware of that that is what you what you um have um in our uh, 16th century gallery and these boxes are below that now that's all light sensitive material. And when you press a button, the light would go on for just one minute and then it turns off again because, you know, uh, uh, to, to expose the object not to too much light. But in fact, on the halogen one, because they don't like to be turned off and on constantly, uh, you had this device next to it, which is like an aperture, which opens and closes literally like, like on, a, on, a, on a camera. Uh, the lens, so the light would be on permanently at 100 watt, while the, the uh, light you see in the display case would only be on for a minute. Uh, terrible waste of energy, absolutely a terrible waste of energy, and I, I took to my mission to change that, and we did that very quickly. And we now got to replace with these, these LED lights, which literally come on when you press a button, and they go off when you and no one is there, so they literally run for that one minute you want to see the light. Um, also, obviously, <clears throat> that saved us a lot of money because uh, it's not just the energy we need here to actually power that, that halogen light, it also, the air can work really hard to get rid of that hot air because we have more of a problem of heat than actually um, cold in, 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 uh, even in winter time, we, because obviously every visitor under normal circumstances pre-COVID, gives off 100 watt heat, so you don't have, you actually have to heat that much in a, in a museum. And uh, here we got all other boxes, all other uh, uh, um, display cases we converted into, into LED. In this case, we use shot, but there are many other ones. And they're just like 20 watt, and they're instead of 100 watt, and they give you a tremendous amount of light. It's they're really, really nice. And so we, we cut down our power consumption by two thirds to just seven kilowatt. But before we had about 21 kilowatt hours a day on that, and now we got less than seven kilowatt hours because obviously I, I haven't counted in the money we saved by not having the aircon running. Um, we also did other one. These are fluorescent uh, tube lit, uh, top lit cases. These objects all sit on glass shelves. Obviously, the light comes from the top. By the time the light comes to the bottom, you have a very dark, dark display indeed. And what we did actually here, we just barely, same, it's still the same case, but we actually used LED strip lights. So these are these LED strip lights. Um, you buy by the meter. I'll show you on the, on the next slide. And we barely put those strip lights and we actually glued them at the front of the shelf at the little molding we made. On a, it's difficult to say, but basically underneath each shelf is a tiny wooden molding, uh, which is angled, and that's where we basically glued uh, these uh, LED lights by the meter on, and um, you got a lovely wash of light. It's very low cost, they're incredibly cheap, and you can actually appreciate all the artwork, and we checked the light, obviously, for UV and everything, so it's all, all absolutely fine for the object. Then we went over also, uh, these are uh, Venetian glass, what we got here. It's incredibly fragile and it has to be maintained by 40% relative humidity all the time. So it's very important that sort of got micro cracks that scares me terribly. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, the craftsmanship is just out of this world, but it's, just, it's so fragile. And so we actually have in this case, we have a, a, in the box, in this you see underneath um, detail of this display case which is not completely sealed. 
We call the Han unit down there, which actually humidifies and dehumidifies uh, to 40%. And uh, we had one in there literally 10 years ago. We put one in. It broke just recently, completely kaput. We couldn't repair it. Um, so we had to order new ones. The new one was 4,000 pounds. The old one was a bit less. But basically, it's 4,000 pound investments for 10 years, so 400 pounds a year, to make sure that these uh, uh, amazing Venetian glass uh, vessels um, stay uh, at, at their very best. So instead of trying to get the whole room to the right environment, that's a display case. Before we did this with, with fume silica, and now we're doing it with that box. It's, it's much it's much easier, and it's hardly use any energy. It's really, really uh, little implemented. The next one is we uh, installed air-to-air -air source heat pumps on the third floor. Uh, we started in the furniture conservation department, or, sorry, furniture conservation studio, where we basically uh, uh, took our system off the main system, because obviously, you know, we were part of the main air conditioning system. And that proved very, very difficult this summer. We didn't, we didn't have enough cooling power because we were the last, so to say, in the food chain. The galleries were first, then the conservation studios. And so I said to my boss at the time, could we not just invest in an air, air source heat pump? And that's my first unit. I think you see it actually in the background. You can see it above me hanging there. It does a fantastic job. Uh, it's literally now 10 years old. It cost 6,000 pounds at the time. And, and very recently we installed um, two Daikin Uruguru Sahara. It's a really odd name, but that's what they're called. Uruguru Sahara and, uh, from Daikin. And they cost two plus 5,000 pounds. So just to show you again how the cost has gone down tremendously. And these are fantastic units because they humidify as well as dehumidify. And without being plugged into the mains, that's quite unique. Obviously, air con you can always dehumidify. But normally, if you want to humidify, you would have to humidify it in there. But in this case, the daikon, they actually use the water from the condenser and actually be, um, put it back into the, the room if, if you want. So we can actually create fantastic environmental condition for our object. Now, uh, Next one is basically our own energy generation at the Wallace Collection. And we got now eight solar panels up there on our uh, um, roof facing south, uninterrupted south. Well, obviously, when you see that, we, you can barely see those. I mean, if you come to the Wallace Collection tomorrow, uh, I mean, when we open next week, hopefully, uh, you can not barely see them. You have to go on the literally third floor outside on the balcony, and then you see them. That's where I took that picture. And uh, of course, I would have loved to have the whole south-facing roof blasted with solar panels, but it's very difficult. Um, it's, it's a museum, and obviously, you have to convince people. And uh, I mean, I had a meeting with architects in 2014 where the architect was telling me, well, it's pretty immature technology there. And uh, so, yeah, so it, it goes slowly, much slower than I'm hoping, but it's at least in the right direction. And obviously now the technology has moved on yet again, that's only two years old. I mean, now you buy panels which are even more powerful and cheaper. So, you know, maybe in the near future, we have more solar panels there, which are even more efficient than the one we have. Um, that brings me now back. It's now sort of a home run. So that is sort of what we've done at the Wallace Collection. What we still like to do, we, I like to decentralize the aircon system have more smaller units uh, for room by room technique. I would like to have more solar panel, uh, groundwater heat pump, etc. There is much, much room for, for improvement, but we we going we going in the right direction. Uh, that's my own home here you see in the background. And uh, I converted that. It, it made a bit of headlines sort of in the Guardian and and in in uh, in um, uh, telegraph telegraph that, uh, Daily Mail, no, not Daily Mail, but the Telegraph. And uh, and I was, you know, I mean, we were part of, of, of stories of, of uh, three families who basically, in one thing, said, could, could you live in a carbon, could you live a low carbon life? And that was a story of three people or three families. And the other one was uh, living in a zero emission family. How hard can it be? It was also three families and we were featured in the, in the Times. Whatever. Point is, is, at your own home, I could do much more. It's, it's a very low cost conversion, 
we did it. And obviously the bank financed my PV solar panels, which you can see up there, on the, you can see my cursor. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's fantastic. It, it really works very well. So why I buy basically 4,000 kilowatt hours off the grid, I got no gas, there's no gas connection. I, I got rid of that. Uh, why I basically buy 4,000 kilowatt hours of renewable energy only off the grid, I produce 3,000 kilowatt hours. And that's basically in, in sunny London, in zone two, with 16 square meter of solar panels, I produce enough energy to be nearly carbon neutral. Yeah, I mean, I'm carbon neutral anyway, because I got 100% renewable energy supply, but the point is, is uh, I, I produce nearly as much as I, I need. Yeah, over the course of a year, I export in the summer vast amount, and I import in the winter vast amount. But for seven, eight months a year, I produce more energy than I need, and then the rest I <coughs> have to import electricity. And just here, yeah, just want to show you that, like, obviously in my house, I could use a huge amount of electricity and energy if I wanted to, but I try to save everything. That sort of cooking, I got a duction hop, and and I got uh, electric under under for heating. I got an air-to-air -air source heat pump, but. Only on induction cooking, and actually you can put a towel around your 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 pan and actually cook your meal in it, and you actually save energy. It's like you know, it's just a question of time. Then you have a twin twin wall like here, my coffee here. It's stainless steel twin wall. Since you have pots and pans in the same technique, and here is two boats uh, I had built or we had built. One was with my uh, wife. Uh, this one here. Um, which is Steelworks a pair of Steelworks, but hasn't got any any solar panels at all. It's still quite conventional in this respect, but it had fantastic insulation, and we basically insulated that boat to, to the best we could. There is up here this boat, Bauhaus made also a bit of a headline um, because obviously a it's a floating brick, you can't miss it. It's it's huge, but a it was nearly our target. But all of these are solar panels called Bauhaus Barge. We still got a video online if you're fancy looking at it. Turns the volume down, you may not appreciate its music. Um, so, but it's 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 quite fun. Um, it was uh, amazingly expensive. I just want to say this, these solar panels were just so expensive. Uh, they cost me uh, twelve thousand pounds at the time, and that was for for one twenty five square meter PV solar. That was just ten years ago. We're talking about not hundred years ago, ten years ago. 25 square meter of PV solar, giving me 1.64 kilowatt hours peak. Sorry, 1.64 kilowatt peak, not hour peak, kilowatt peak, um, and cost me 12,000 pounds in 2010. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's basically my, my system at my house cost me also 12,000 pounds, but I got twice the amount of electricity out of it. Plus, here's the inverter for that to convert that cost me six and a half thousand pounds. So, just to, to um, put that sort of in context, how quickly the technology has moved on. And uh, we nearly to the end, nearly to the end, bear, bear, bear with me. Uh, to infinity and beyond is my thing. And just like saying how many institutions, uh, Church of England, quite interestingly, first one to announce 2030. I mean, not the first one, but, but, but quite early on. In carbon use by 2030, we got here national trust. We got 200 councils across the country, companies. So 2030, it's a realistic goal for so many companies. Well, we could all do it. We could all do it quite quite easily, and we have to become as an, as an individual as well as a nation totally self-sufficient in terms of energy. And here's the last slide I have, I promise, and I got only then the thank you slide. Is um, Richard Wallace, obviously, uh, you can read up about him, you know, don't ask me too many very detailed questions about him, but he's an amazing, an amazing person. He's done so much great, great stuff in his life, yeah, and uh, giving money for hospitals, for these Wallace fountains, these are Wallace fountains, he was really a, a remarkable man. And, uh, and yeah, he's obviously known for the Wallace collection, but, but he done so much more, so much more um, in, in a schools built in, in, in Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. Remarkable, do read up about him. And there's obviously a book you can buy again, uh, which my colleague wrote, Susan Higgett, is, is absolutely amazing. And what I was thinking, what would he do today? I mean, he gave these Wallace founders, he built these Wallace founders in Paris to, uh, uh, Give, give the population water after the Russian uh, uh, um, Franco uh, war and uh, had these fountains everywhere placed. 
And what would he do today? And that was a question I always asked me myself, like what would Richard Wallace do? Would he basically invest into com community energy? You know, uh, would he build instead of water fountain here, having cars refilled with, with, uh, with electricity uh, from, from him? Um, and that's, I think I covered pretty much everything. And yeah, thank you very much. And uh, over to Joseph, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jürgen. There are many, many questions and I'll go straight to them. So we'll try to get through as many as possible in the time we have. Um, so um, starting with the first one, which is by Robert Lowther, who says, what are the planning obstacles regarding the reinstatement of the ownings? So again, that... that you can have a look at the questions as well if you want to open them. The first one at the top is, what are the planning obstacles? obstacles regarding? Oh, yeah. yeah, so very, got you. What are the planning obstacles regarding? Well, you, you need planning permission to, to have those done. And that would be the very first obstacle. And I don't know how easy that would be to convince the planning inspectors that that should be. Because you've got the cases there and we got we got basically some, the evidence in your face that there used to be owning. So I guess that is a hurdle which just has a price tag attached to it. And obviously all of these things cost money and you have to convince stakeholder or some benefactor to put money up for awnings. Uh, and then obviously there wouldn't be awnings which you would constantly wind up and down that would have to be something a little bit more permanent, I would think maybe put perforated steel colored to look like fabric. I don't know, but, but it has been debated. that we have spoken to architects and advisors and it's just, it hasn't been done. I mean, I want to have them, yeah, it's, it's something which we're working on. Then there are a good many questions that ask you about the, all the environmental work that you have presented. The first one is, what are the environmental standards used and how flexible are them? Uh, we understand, first of all. This, this, um, this doesn't come from the q and I'm reading some that were done in the chat. Uh, oh, sorry, so, okay, so these are, what, what, again, sorry. It asks, what are the environmental standards used? Oh, yes. And how flexible are they? Yeah, so what, what we use normally in the galleries, we, we aim for 50% relative humidity at 20 degrees centigrade. So that is what we're aiming for, yeah? And we try to always keep it at, at around 50%. There is a plus minus 5% tolerance. That's like the general loan requirement. But what we've done in the galleries, we're a bit more generous and we say, okay, it can go up, up 7, 8% plus or minus. So we still aim for 50%, but there's a bit more tolerance. So we, we increase the dead band of our, our system to have a little bit more space. While in the exhibition gallery, when we have loans, it's much tighter environmental conditions. So we always match that with, with what, we, what we get, basically. Uh, then we can continue with the one you, you were uh, looking at that asks, what causes, what causes the Venetian glass to break when it is not at 40% relative humidity? That's uh, but basically they have they have crystals building so i'm not a i'm not a class expert but basically from what i these objects are often in my studio to be worked on and basically you have uh it, it's a very sodium rich class and so crystal will, will form if the humidity is too high if it yet goes too dry you have a problem that it becomes too fragile i mean i, I didn't realize before i saw this object there that they're obviously not organic, but they nearly react like an organic material, like like wood. So um, the salt crystal form, and they have to be one has to be very careful, otherwise they just shatter. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, I'll move on to the next one then. How stable is the air rate maintained by the aircon units that you have mentioned? They're, they're absolutely fine. So basically what we realized in my studio up here, so my, my aircon system has got no humidification. So I got this very first aircon system, which literally just heats and cools and that's that. But we got a small humidifier here, which I use if I really have something here fragile, which really needs to have a good, well-maintained environment. 
So we're all connected to a telemetric monitoring system. In our case, we call Miko. It, it's an ecosystem, but there's also other companies around. But we use Miko, and there we basically monitor the environment, not just in the galleries, but also in our studio. And what we realize is that the relative humidity doesn't even fluctuate that that much, even if we heat up that room. So only if I have something really fragile here, and I really have to maintain strict conditions, I have a little portable humidifier which I use. Um, that's th there are several questions related to these humidifiers. A connected one is what are the advantages of more smaller aircon units compared to a centralized system? The system there is, if, if our big system fails, there are barely three big air handling units. If one fails, we have quite a few galleries down, yeah, that may be for short time, maybe for maintenance, yeah. But if we have a small decentralized system, it's a little bit like having many wind turbines, solar, and having a real nice energy mix rather than relying on a big coal power plant or nuclear. It's like if one goes down, you have these alternatives. Plus, the smaller units, you also, they're, they're very easy to maintain. There's a big unit we have. We have this huge chiller on the roof. They're, they're quite difficult to maintain. And as I said, if one breaks down, you really had it. And otherwise, you have many small units. And yeah, I, I see this as a great advantage. Um, there's another question that I'm, I'm not totally sure I understand it, but maybe you will. Uh, it says, how do you mitigate issues with the legionnaires with your dehumidifiers? Um, but we, 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 um, the Legionnaires disease, I mean, we don't have, my little, my little humidifier is an evaporative type one. Yeah. So I don't think I never crossed my mind that we would have a Legionnaires problem with that because there's more um, evaporative ones that don't basically steam them up. There is all the, the one we use in the galleries, the high chromatic ones. And the high chromatic ones, they literally boil water and you barely, it's a very hot system. So you would never get Legionnaires disease in, in that system. It's impossible. And this evaporative type, I, it's news to me. I, I don't think I'm, I don't know. Um, there's, I'll go one then. Um, have you made any changes to the temperature and humidity specifications to save energy? For example, letting temperature go colder in winter and higher in summer? Uh, absolutely, we, 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 we try to do that. So that's what we've been doing quite actively now to, to change the temperature setting. But again, with the big system we have currently in place, it, it proves again and again very difficult, very challenging. You need to have a lot of engineers on site to do even small changes. You know, it, it's and you always encounter another issue. So that's why, why I like to have it here, just one fit for all throughout the year. They do make changes, yeah, but but it's an ongoing issue. I mean, we we, we try to make it cold and I mean now, for example. If no visitors at all, we could be very much cooler than we are, um, but, but we're not. For me, it doesn't go far enough, but then you talk to the engineers and they say, well, it's really difficult to, to, to do that now and, and keep the museum for, let's say, one month when we have got no visitor at all, down to 16 degrees or whatever. It's, it's not that straightforward, I'm afraid. And again, with a small de a small decentralized system, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced you could manage that because you just as a button and job done, you know. Uh, there is a question now that has been asked uh, twice. It's a really important question. Um, the question is, um, how, how much has the carbon footprint reduced by whether you have uh, estimated that? Uh, we, we, we have not measured that, the carbon footprint, because we've never done a carbon footprint assessment, not so far. We have an energy assessment, and you can see that, I think it's actually online, in fact, uh, on how our energy consumption is per, I think it, it's expressed in kilowatt hours per year, if I'm not totally mistaken. Uh, and I guess you can then calculate the carbon footprint, but also um, we had in some stage, we had uh, renewable only supplier. So I don't know how you would then translate that 
if you would say, well, we, we actually carbon neutral because we buy our energy from a renewable only supplier. I, again, an answer, I can't give you a straight answer there, I'm afraid. Um, fair enough. Um, the, the, the time is, is over, actually, we're past one hour, and there are still uh, so many questions. Clearly, your experience, uh, your practical experience, um, it's very appreciated, Jürgen. I will select one of those, uh, which I think perhaps is in a slightly different topic um, to end with. Um, it's one that asks about the, the carbon footprint of cloud storage and how it fits with all this picture of energy savings. Um, I will rephrase as slightly the, the question, but basically asks whether it's that a cost that you have considered or that the Wallace collection also incurs and whether it should be factored in in the total um, energy consumption when one does this kind of analysis. So cloud storage, or for example, storing digital information online and so on. I don't know if you engage in any digitization at all, and whether it is- no, I, 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 Absolutely. No, again, I have, I have to, to pass on this one. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, that is, it's a huge, I don't know if, if what is huge, but it has a carbon footprint. All our digital storage, no question about that. There, there is, we, we, we store a lot of data digitally on site, but also off site. We now uh, changing over to cloud system, the cloud based system, cloud based system. And uh, yeah, but, but I, I have no idea how much that would be uh, that sort of storage. Absolutely no. Perfect. Um, is it okay, Jürgen, if we leave it here then? Um, with, unless you see the questions, if there's one last one that you really want to answer, maybe we can do it. You ask you know, as long as we have, have people, you can go to, I, I haven't got any plans to go anywhere, so <laughs> we can go on for another 10 minutes. What? Yeah. What if I do the following? We close the formal meeting here, and if anyone wants to keep having an informal conversation with you about your experience, they are free to stay around. And so I, fi I finish here with a virtual round of applause and by thanking you for presenting and sharing your <laughs> vast you practical having. experience. Thank, Thank you very much, Jürgen. The next, uh, there will be one last uh, talk just before Christmas. It's advertised already. Um, so check our website for, for details. I hope to see you all then.